subject of the tyranny of the weaker brethren. And before I look at the Scripture, let me ask you, how many of you have never, ever either preached or heard a message on the tyranny of the weaker brother? Let me see. Okay, most of you. That's good. So, I hope you don't say the same thing at the end of this day. (laughs) I'd like you to look with me to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, and again I'll ask you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who weak is weak eats only vegetables. You know, that has to be true. That's, that's, a, verse, that's a verse that proves inerrancy if there is <laughs> any verse here. <clears throat> Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand." One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat, and gives God thanks." For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that He might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. So why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let not one judge another any more, but resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. For I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. And finally, therefore let us pursue the thing which makes for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for a man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith, and from from whatever is not from faith is sin." This, of course, is the passage where Paul speaks about the consideration that we are to have for one another's particular scruples and sensitivities, not unlike at all the treatment that Paul gives in his letter to the Corinthians when he dealt with a particular issue 
of the question of eating meat had, had been offered to idols. This is written to us for our edification, carries with it the solemn weight and authority of God Himself. Let's be seated. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, again we ask You to send help to minister to the weakness of our understanding, that we may prove correct in our understanding of Your Word, and that by Your Spirit You would convict us of sin where we need it, encourage us to faith where we need that, and in all things illumine to us Your Word. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. The progress of the Christian life following our justification is that progress in sanctification by which we are called to grow to maturity and into conformity to the image of Christ. In the defense of the gospel of justification by faith alone, Martin Luther said that justification is by faith alone but not by a faith that is alone. A true faith that is saving faith immediately, necessarily, and inevitably begins to show forth the fruit of that faith in this progress of sanctification. I don't think it's by accident that the Holy Spirit directed the Apostle to teach us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work within us both to will and to do. That means that we are not to be at ease in Zion, we are not to be quietists who merely let go and let God, but the whole Christian pilgrimage, the whole Christian life is one that involves serious labor. It is a labor that is performed with a sense of fear and of trembling, that godly fear of reverence and adoration in the hearts of those who tremble in the presence of the living God. And so the progress of sanctification is not one that is undertaken in a casual manner. Now, when we look at this matter of sanctification, we see various pitfalls that undermine that progress along the way. And perhaps the two most frequent and dangerous pitfalls to our progress are the distortions that we call antinomianism and legalism. And just for a brief refresher before we go to this text this afternoon, let me remind you of the basic content or spirit or motivation behind these two distortions. Antinomianism means, of course, anti-lawism, and it carries the idea that once I am saved by grace, I no longer have to be concerned about living a life of obedience or give any particular significance to the law of God. The favorite hymn of the antinomian is the hymn that sings, free from the law, O blessed condition, I can sin all I want and still have remission. One of the critical concerns and fears that 16th century Rome had with the advent of the Reformation is that this doctrine of justification by faith alone would lead to a spirit of antinomianism, because once the law had fulfilled its elliptical purpose of driving us to Christ and driving us to the gospel, it would have no more impact or influence uh, among us. And there were those at the time of the Reformation who literally moved in that direction. The Reformed wing, of course, of the Reformation 
was convinced that though the ceremonial law of the Old Testament, the dietary laws and that sort of thing have been fulfilled in Christ and therefore abrogated, nevertheless those laws that are rooted and grounded in the very character of God and are revealed in His moral law still have relevance to the Christian, not as a means by which we achieve salvation, but rather as a means by which we proceed in sanctification to do that which is pleasing to God. But we live in a time within the evangelical church where antinomianism is epidemic, particularly in one brand of evangelicalism that I won't mention that uh, teach in their doctrine that the Old Testament law has no further import to the life of the Christian. And in that antinomian spirit, we have seen, I think, one of the most destructive doctrines that has been embraced widely in the evangelical community, which is the concept of the carnal Christian, which from one perspective is an oxymoron, it's a contradiction in terms. On the other sense, it does have some application. In the one sense, all of us who are in Christ remain carnal to a certain degree because the impact of the sarks or of the flesh is not completely eradicated until we enter into heaven and into glory. But that's not usually what is in view when we hear that concept of the carnal Christian. This is the idea that a person can be saved, come to true saving faith in Jesus Christ, receive Christ as Savior, but not as Lord, and may never produce any fruit of a sanctified life, but may remain utterly and totally carnal until death. In this case, Christ is in the person's life, at, but not reigning on the throne of His life, but rather self remains established in the governing center and core of the, of the person. I don't know where this comes from, other than from bad theology and perhaps from a motivation to explain the problem I was speaking of earlier this morning about those who have been zealously pursued in evangelism, who make a profession of faith, and then show absolutely no fruit and no change in order to account for that theologically. We say, well, they're Christians. They've received Jesus as Savior, but they haven't recognized Him as Lord yet, and uh, you don't have to have the fruit of any kind of obedience as evidence of saving faith, and you are still a Christian. Despite that, I had a young man in, in the church on one occasion who was uh, uh, living with his girlfriend, and with, the two of them were indulging in and practicing in the sale of drugs and being confronted. Since he was a church member, he said, don't worry about me. He said, I'm I'm a carnal Christian. I'll be all right. This is antinomianism with a vengeance, and it undermines uh, the true uh, development of a Christian. But on the other side of the equation is the threat that's always there of legalism. And if I would say to you, what is legalism? How do you think you would frame an answer to that question? I don't think it's an easy question to answer because there's not one single monolithic form of legalism. There are varieties, different types of legalism. The worst meaning of legalism has reference to the idea <clears throat> that by your works you can satisfy the demands of God's law and can gain salvation 
through your own works of the law. That is the view that is so widely held by people who have never heard the Bible say that by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, because, in fact, the vast majority of people out there really believe in a legalistic manner and means of being redeemed. Uh, which is false not only with respect to the way of salvation set forth in Scripture, but it is a way of salvation that if it were indeed the biblical way of salvation, would cause these people who believed it nothing but everlasting doom, because none of us do the works of the law that are required to satisfy the legal demands of God. Other forms of legalism, which were those, were perfected by the Pharisees that drew the rebuke and at times the wrath of our Lord Himself. For example, the Pharisees were fond of majoring in minors. That's a form of legalism where you give great zeal and great attention to minor matters of the law at the expense of and at the same time ignoring the weightier matters of the law. Incidentally, Jesus spoke of the Pharisees who tithe their mint and so on and uh, omitted the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and He said with respect to the tithe, this you should have done. But even the tithe, which is something they should do, is a minor matter compared to the more important matters that are found in Scriptures. You know people like that. They're scrupulous in their church attendance. They wouldn't think of shorting God in the collection plate. They are regular tithers. But as far as the rest of the fruit of the Spirit is concerned, they could care less. They have majored in minors. The other thing that the Pharisees were experts at were a kind of ethical loopholeism. If they could obey the letter of the law, never mind the spirit of the law, if they could find a way around it. If they wanted to go on a trip that was more than a Sabbath day's journey, they would simply during the week had merchants along the way leave one of their toothbrushes under a rock at various intervals because legally the presence of one's toothbrush established legal residence, and so even though they made the trip of 15 miles, they only went so far between these rocks containing their uh, toothbrushes, so never went more than a Sabbath day journey. These were Philadelphia lawyers before there was a Philadelphia in America. But one of the most destructive forms of legalism then and now, the one that was most seriously practiced by the Pharisees was to add to the law of God, to bind men's consciences where God had left them free, substituting the human traditions for the law of God. And we wag our fingers at the Pharisees for doing that, but that problem has plagued the church in every generation. So do you see the problem we have between Scylla and Charybdis, between antinomianism on the one hand and legalism on the other? You might ask yourself where you tend to fall off which side of the horse, and what kind of an atmosphere you have in your church. Now, connection connected closely to these poles of legalism and antinomianism are the questions of matters, audiophorus, and Christian liberty. Now, what are we talking about here? The relationship between Christian liberty and that which is audiophorous, or the so-called audiophora. The audiophora are those things which the Apostle Paul's things that are indifferent. 
that is, in matters that are indifferent, refers to those areas where God has not commanded to do or to abstain from. One has Christian liberty in that particular zone. Christian liberty never gives anybody the liberty to disobey God. And that's another form of antinomianism where Christian liberty becomes the disguise or the license for licentiousness, where people saying, I'm free, I've been liberated by the Spirit, and so I can disobey God. I can remember with horrific memories doing a teaching mission in a wealthy community in, outside of New York City where I was invited uh, to speak on the holiness of God, and I was housed in a splendid mansion that was uh, decorated by all kinds of original art. It was almost looking like a, a subdivision of the Metropolitan Museum. I'd never been in a home where there was so much wealth so obviously display. And the host of this conference where they asked me to speak on the holiness of God after I gave my messages, invited me back to this house with the members of the steering committee for this mission, some 15 people, to have a time of prayer, and invited me to do that. And I said, well, of course, I'd be happy to do that. So we retired after the church meetings, came back to this marvelous mansion, and we gathered for prayer. And all of a sudden, the people turned the lights out and uh, stop me if I'm lying, they started praying to their deceased relatives. I was in the middle of a seance. <laughs> and I said, whoo, I said, wait a minute, time out. And they said, what's the matter? I said, do you realize that, that you're not allowed to do this sort of thing? That we're not allowed to pray to the dead? And I said, that, and I started giving them passages from the Old Testament how that this was a capital offense in Israel, and that God considered it an abomination, and that He would punish the whole country if they tolerated this sort of behavior. And you know what their response was, quite glibly? That was the Old Testament. I said, well, tell me what has happened in the course of redemptive history that has made a practice that at one time was utterly repugnant to God, now something that would be pleasing to them. And they, of course, tried to play the trump card of Christian liberty to justify this sort of thing. We're not under the law. Don't lay a guilt trip on us, Dr. Sproul, and impose some kind of foreign standards here. These are the problems that we have. And the matters of consulting sorcerers and necromancers and uh, wizards and that sort of thing, those are not considered in the Bible to be audiophorous, matters that are indifferent. They are matters that profoundly uh, are profoundly important. And so then we have connected that, that I say, said, to the matters of that are indifferent the real concept of Christian liberty, and how we as Christians can coexist when we don't always have the same understanding of what it is that fits into the category of audiophora, and where our Christian liberty begins and where it ends. That was a problem in the Corinthian church. It was a problem now among the Romans, Christians, and it has been a problem in the church ever since. So it's that question that Paul is addressing here in chapter 14 of Romans, and let's spend a few minutes there. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Now, remember that you have that passage to use as a club 
the next time your vegetarian friend tries to impose vegetarianism on you, and uh, you can remind them that they are the weaker uh, brothers and sisters because they see something wrong with meat. Well, Paul's saying, in the body of Christ, you have people that eat meat and you have people that are vegetarians. And you don't agree on, on what is the best way to live your life. Now, Paul does identify here that the weaker Christian is the one who has this particular sensitivity and scruple about a matter of which God has not legislated. And so, how are you to respond to the weaker brother who has such a scruple? Well, Paul, using this example here of eating food and vegetables, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Look, the person who is a vegetarian and a Christian belongs to Christ. The person who's not a vegetarian belongs to, and is a Christian belongs to Christ. We both belong to Christ. How dare we judge one who is Christ's servant? If we are to judge, we are to judge according to the explicit standards set forth in sacred Scripture, not by scruples invented by human traditions. Now, I don't think it's as bad today as it was 50 years ago, but 50 years ago, evangelicalism was plagued by a kind of spirit of, of legalism that said that if you're a Christian, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't dance, you don't play cards, you don't go to movies. Now, I'm sure those virtues still prevail in certain places. But this became such a matter that one's entire spirituality and even Christian profession was to be judged by conformity to these specific no-nos or taboos within the Christian community. And you got to go through your Bible, and you can't find anywhere in the Bible where it says you're not allowed to wear lipstick, or you're not allowed to dance, or you're not allowed to go to movies. There's nothing explicit about that in Scripture. But these became so important that they became the tests of one's Christianity. You know, I never first forget the first time I had the existential experience that I. I didn't grow up in that kind of environment. I grew up in an extremely liberal uh, church. And uh, when I became a Christian and went to seminary and graduate school and began my teaching career, I was always the arch conservative of any Christian gathering. But one of the things my wife and I liked to do for uh, relaxation uh, during those days was to play bridge. In fact, we played in bridge tournaments. And uh, nobody ever raised any spiritual questions about that until I had an appointment to teach at a Christian college. And my first day on the campus, I saw some students gathered there playing cards. And that cards looked different. And I said, what are you playing? And they said, Rook. I said, oh, I remember that. We did that when we were eight years old. We used to play Rook. And I said, well, what, what really is Rook? And they said, it's the Christian card game. And then I discovered that it was a sin to play bridge because the deck of cards had the joker, and the joker was a portrait of the devil and all that. And I listened to that, and I said, what's going to happen to me? I'm the Bible teacher here, <laughs> and my wife and I play bridge. You know, where am I, Lord? I had never encountered that. I had freshly come from the university campus during the period of the SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society, where they provoked the revolution of the decade of the 60s, beginning out there at Sproul Hall. My relatives at the University of California didn't know how to pronounce their own name. 
uh, with the free speech movement that began there, and then every college campus in the nation was besieged by sit-ins and protests in the dean's office and that sort of thing. And I had been in one college campus where the students put the uh, sit-in and they declared that they had the right to determine what courses they had to take to fulfill the requirements for their major. I was, I was teaching philosophy and these students came in to refreshment telling me that uh, what the curriculum should be to major in that field. And I said, well, what do you know about this field? And they knew nothing. But they demanded the right to prescribe the curriculum. When I went to the Christian college, while I was there, they had a sit-in. They had a big student protest demanding the right to have a jukebox in the student center. I said, I've never seen this. They weren't allowed to go to movies. They weren't allowed to do this and do that. And I said, these people are de- judging what Christianity is on the basis of this. I remember once a church meeting, we went out to the, this lady had a Bible study, and she took us out for dinner to treat about 20 people, and the poor waitress in the restaurant came up with her pad and pencil, and she said, may I take your drink order? And the lady said, oh, no, nobody here drinks. We're Christians. I came so close, (laughs) so close. I didn't but I wanted to order something like a double scotch on the rocks, and I wouldn't even know what that tasted like, to tell you the truth. But I I was so embarrassed for this waitress, and I was offended because she had just been rebuked by a well-meaning Christian, and her idea now of what a Christian was was somebody who would never have anything to drink with her dinner. Is that what the gospel is? Is the gospel in eating and drinking? Not what the Apostle Paul is saying here in this text. And yet, there are many Christians who have been warned and raised in the churches and in their homes to believe it's a sin to go to a movie. It's a sin to wear lipstick. It's a sin to drink. It's a sin to do this. It's a sin to do that. They've been taught that it is a sin to do things that God does not declare to be sinful. They are taught that the indulgence of certain things that the Scripture describes as adiaphora are, in fact, a violation of the law of God. Now, here's the dilemma. If I'm born and raised in an environment that tells me that it is a sin for a Christian to go to a movie or to have a glass of wine or whatever, and I believe it's a sin to do that, and then I do it, is it a sin? Yes. Not because the thing itself is sinful, but what is sinful is doing something you believe to be sinful that takes sin to do it. And that's why as we're all struggling together with our backgrounds and our traditions and our love lines and all of this, that we have to be exceedingly sensitive and careful for each other. Going back to the Corinthian problem of meat offered to idols, what happened in the pagan worship services Meat, were, meat was used to satisfy the demands of the gods and the goddesses, and after the religious ceremony was over, that meat was then taken into the marketplace and was sold as meat. And Christians, being sensitive to not wanting any hint of scandal, no association with pagan religion, said, I'm not going to buy that stuff. That stuff's been used and tainted by its involvement in a pagan worship service. What's Paul's view of it? Hey, it's meat. There's nothing wrong with the meat. It's the difference between what we call primary and secondary separation. 
Primary separation is where you separate yourself from doing something sinful. You separate yourself from offering meat to idols. That's a sin. But if I decide I have to separate myself from anybody else who's ever offered meat to idols or from the meat itself, that's what we call secondary separation. And to be consistent in the application of the principle of secondary separation, you're going to have to leave the planet because no matter where you are and what you do and from whom you buy, you're going to be dealing at some level with people who are involved in sin. But again, the question that the Apostle's addressing is, how does the stronger brother who knows that this is a matter that's audioforous and is not something that's prescribed by God deal with the brother or sister that has this scruple? You can make fun of them. You can laugh at them. You can be all over them with criticism. Or you can respect their conscience. And you can say, okay, I know that you have this scruple, and I don't want to make you stumble by trying to entice you to indulge in something that you are convinced is a violation of the law of God. Paul says, and I don't think he's just being uh, using uh, hyperbole, I will give up meat altogether for the sake of my weaker brother. That is his attitude. If a person has a scruple that I don't share and they have that scruple unto the Lord, and because their conscience is held captive by their understanding of the things of God, I am to bend over backwards to be caring, loving, sensitive to that person, and not flaunt my liberty in their face. Paul says that person has that, their scruple and they have it to the Lord. And if you have your freedom and you enjoy your freedom, you do it unto the Lord. But you <clears throat> sometimes do it in private so as not to scandalize the weaker brother. So do you see that our liberty, the freedom that has been given to us by God in the way in which we carry out our lives, is not a, an, an autonomy whereby we're allowed to do anything we feel like doing, but it is a freedom that must always be accompanied by a charitable sensitivity to those who have scruples that are different from ours. That's simple. But here's where it gets complicated, and that's what the major subject I've been given to discuss. And that is, what happens when the weaker brother wants to elevate the scruple that he or she has to the level of a moral standard for Christianity or a standard that must be obeyed to be a member in good standing? or a standard that it becomes necessary to be obeyed in order to be an officer in the church. Now what? Now the weaker brother becomes the legislating brother, and now begins to take the scruple that he or she has and uses it to bind the consciences of the people and destroy Christian liberty. What do you do now? That's one question. Another question that's close on its heels is the question, who really is the weaker brother? How do you discern it? We have to be very sure 
that the standards we impose upon people in the church are biblical standards and not our own traditional scruples. I've known ministers who have required of their elders that they must sign a pledge not to have any kind of alcoholic beverage, including wine, ever, in order to be qualified to be an officer in the church, making a standard in the church that would preclude the membership of the Apostle Paul, and yes, of Jesus Himself. And of course, that same pastor will turn around and tell you that, oh, this is, uh, this is a, a, a certain important matter because clearly the wine that was used in the Bible was not fermented. It was non-fermented wine. Uh, well, it's not so clear. Jesus was not called a wine bibber because He drank Welch's grape juice. Nobody worried about exploding old wineskins by putting grape juice in them. It's not grape juice that maketh the wine or that maketh the heart glad. It's not grape juice that you take for your stomach's sake and so on. The attempts to interpret the biblical meaning of the term oinos as grape juice are attempts at despair, where they have an example of a cultural thing like we have in America forced upon the Scripture. You go to Palestine, and you say to those people over there that the grape, the vineyards and so on that were used in antiquity were used simply to make raisins and grape juice, they will laugh you to scorn, and rightly so. No doubt, a strong, vehement prohibition against drunkenness. But we add to the standards of God. Now, here's my problem. When the pastor imposes that standard that I've just used as an example, or any other such extra-biblical standard, on the church, on the elders, can that minister claim to be a weaker brother. Ministers should not be weaker brothers. Ministers should be able to handle the Scriptures in a way as to not be caught up in issues of whether you eat meat or are vegetarians. You should know better than that. Nevertheless, we do have weaker brothers who are in positions of leadership and authority within the church. And we are not the first generation to experience it. Let me take you for a moment back to the Galatians, which we've heard so much about today. Let's look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face. Why? Because he was to be blamed. Here we have a controversy between the two titans of the apostolic community, between Peter and Paul. And not only that, but they have this confrontation, and it's not like Paul says to Peter, hey, Pete, can I have a word with you <laughs> privately about something? We st he, he withstood Peter to his face. And not only that, under the impetus of the Holy Spirit, incorporates it in sacred Scripture for the whole world to know that these two apostles had this confrontation. 
Well, what was it about? I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Peter was blameworthy. For before certain men came from James, that is from Jerusalem, he would eat with the Gentiles. You remember the whole thing at uh, uh, Cornelius' household and the vision and, and the making of the unclean foods clean. And Peter was the one who receives this revelation. But not all the rest of the Jewish community had been in on that uh, abrogation of the dietary laws. And so Peter now, when he's with the Gentiles, he's eating freely, not suffering the Jewish dilemma of free ham. Boy, it is too close to lunchtime. <laughs> but when they came, that is, the ones from Jerusalem, He withdrew, separated Himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, if you're a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not of the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law. For the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. See, now this question was not a simple matter of scruples between believers over eating vegetables or eating meat or drinking wine or not drinking wine. This whole matter had escalated into the Judaizer heresy by which the Judaizers claiming to be Christians were reinstituting the requirements of the dietary laws and that sort of thing, the ceremonial laws of Old Testament Israel upon Christian believers. Now that Judaizing heresy was an error that we could call a serious error of the weaker brethren. These Judaizers couldn't live with the liberty that Christ had given them from these Old Testament practices. And Jesus gave that liberty not simply out of kindness and saying, I don't want you to be bound by difficult things to obey, but there were profound theological concerns there. The way of salvation itself. Paul is saying, don't you see that if you enforce circumcision again, once the significance of circumcision has been fulfilled once and for all in the death of Jesus Christ, who was circumcised in our place, being cursed by God, that you are now placing yourself symbolically under all of the terms of the old covenant that have already been fulfilled by Jesus, and you're crucifying Christ afresh. So now, it's not just a matter of little scruples. It's the matter of the gospel. Later on in Galatians, he writes in chapter 5, verse 7, you ran well, past tense. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you in the Lord 
that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And if I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. And I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Listen, do you hear how harsh the apostles being here? Those of you who are troubling you with the doctrine of circumcision, I wish they would be circumcised. Literally, cut off from the presence of God. But you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another." Back again to sensitivity to the weaker brother and a prohibition against biting and devouring one another over these insignificant matters. But you see what happened? The Judaizers were coming to Paul and insisting that he circumcised Titus. And what did Paul do? Well, if you fellows there in Jerusalem have a scruple about this, I'll accommodate you, and I'll circumcise Titus in a religious manner. No. As soon as the weaker brother tried to enforce his weakness as the law of the church, the gospel was threatened. And now, rather than deny his own Christian liberty, the Apostle Paul fought tooth and nail against the tyranny of the weaker brother. As soon as somebody has that scruple by which they're conscience bound to themselves, tries to go beyond themselves and make it the rule of the church, they must be resisted. They must not allow, not be allowed to establish laws where God has left us free. You know, the understanding of these principles I don't think are difficult intellectually. The application of them in real-life situations takes the wisdom of Solomon and then some. We apply the Word of God and the love of Christ that is shed abroad in our hearts, not simply to tenaciously hold on to our own liberty, but to protect the gospel while being patient and gentle with those who are young in the faith, young in their understanding, but at the same time not allow people to tell waitresses and the things, oh, we're Christians. Christians don't do that. That's not true. I didn't say anything, and I was embarrassed that I didn't say anything. But do you understand what I'm saying? And ask yourself, do you impose rules and regulations in your church where God has left people free? We need to be very careful about that for the sake of Christ and for the sake of His little ones. Let's pray. Father, thank You for the grace by which we've been saved and for the liberty that has been given to us by the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, give us hearts that seek not so much to be free of Your law, but to love Your law and to serve You in obedience. For we understand that if we love You, 
we are to obey Your commandments. But give us the wisdom to discern between Your commandments and the commandments of men. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.